We are now on to the evening session. Uh, the first speaker will be Justin Vandette. Again, Mr. Friend, I just want to let you know, so we do have five minutes to speak, and there is a time clock that is just over to my left that I will, uh, you can look at, and I'll indicate just before five minutes if you, if you go beyond. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's uh, a real delight, and it's really wonderful to see the uh, Budget Committee here in East York uh, to, uh, to do these consultations, and I thank all of you for making time out of your schedules to be here. I am here to uh, talk about an alleged uh, savings from the TTC when it comes to their recent decision, and it's a very unfortunate decision, to remove uh, bus schedules from stops at major intersections across the City of Toronto. And while I thought this was a, an isolated matter in East York, affecting a few routes, Cosburn, Mortimer, Woodbine, I've learned that this is happening across the entire city. The TTC, which calls itself the better way, has taken the wrong approach to delivering good public transit and good customer service. This change started on October the 9th, and I've been disappointed by some of the TTC's decisions to change route numbers and the way they deliver the service. They go to all this trouble, they don't seem to finish the job properly. But I've been, la I've been laser focused on this issue because schedules matter to people. And what I've learned is the following. According to the TTC, by their very own numbers, there are some 10,000 uh, stops in the entire city, and 5,000 of them approximately, give or take a few hundred, in the city have a schedule. Those metal schedule holders now encourage riders to download the app to find out when the next bus is coming or to go online. What is troubling is that there are many people in the city who don't own a cell phone or have a data plan or own a personal computer. These would include senior, cit senior citizens and those that live on fixed incomes or those living in poverty. We hear it in the media all the time. We, we watch the news, we read the papers, and we, we hear it about the cost of living going up food, hydro, the basic necessities, taxes, transit, user fees. But how many times have we heard, and how many times have we also heard about people living paycheck to paycheck? As I continue to engage with TTC management, they tell me that these 5,000 schedules will be replaced by a few hundred electronic signs that will be, that will be placed in areas of the city. 5,000 to a few hundred is a significant decline. And the areas that will have fewer schedules are the areas of the city that probably need them more, Scarborough and Etobicoke. People rely on transit to get to school, to get to work, and to get to other appointments. And I've spoken to a lot of people in the city who support the schedules at the bus stops. Among the more notable supporters of my campaign to get East York moving again, to bring back the schedules, are organizations and individuals who have done wonderful things for, for this community and, and, and the city. Gail Nyberg at the Daily Bread Food Bank believes uh, that I've taken up the right cause. So does the Good Neighbors of Toronto, a wonderful organization who takes care of hundreds of people who struggle every day for the basic essentials. Social Planning Toronto, TTCRiders.ca, the Parkview Hills Community Association, the very hardworking MPP Arthur Potts, the Honourable Alan Redway, and former Toronto Mayor Mel Lastman. As a compromise, I would recommend the following. Routes that have buses or streetcars that run frequent service of 10 minutes or less, maybe that's fine for those routes to not have a schedule. But if there are those routes, like the ones around this building, that don't run uh, 10 minutes or less all day, every day, then we sh they should have a posted schedule. And I think that's a basic thing that the people of the city deserve and rely on. I thank you very much for taking the time to hear my deputation. Thank you. Questions? No? Good. Succinct. Thank you. Next is uh, Sarah Earhart. Somebody doesn't want you to depute, I see, or hear. Did you, did you want to do it? You can do it another time, Sarah. We can put you on a list any other time. Yes, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll squeeze you in. Just No, don't worry. Uh, next is Alan McCartney. I am Alan McCarty, who resides in Ward 26, Don Valley West, presided by Councillor John Burnside. I extend my appreciation to the Budget Committee for the opportunity to speak today. 
The proposed budget details numerous cuts to services that are essential investments that must be enhanced. The city's priority appears to be revenue from aggressive redevelopment for intensification that is not intended for essential investment. The freedom to reduce in transportation services, which includes an advanced transit system, inhibits the required annual periodic additions to the underground rail system to include north-south routes. The recent proposed additions are several parallel east-west lines that feed a single north-south line which has reached capacity. Recent federal and provincial funding was dedicated for upgrades and not for the backlog of repairs or transit advancements. A day in the spring of 2015, as I was on my way to City Hall on the Young Line for a meeting with the councillor, a chemical spill at the College Station required that I board a shuttle bus at the Bloor Station. The extremely long line of passengers was discouraging and I decided to take a significant walk to City Hall. <laughs> I would have been late for the meeting had I wanted to board a bus. I waited to board a bus. Elderly citizens and people with disabilities would be at a severe disadvantage when dealing with shuttle buses and the long lines. Toronto has prioritized aggressive redevelopment for the purpose of generating revenue. My neighborhood is experiencing resulting vehicular infiltration to avoid major arteries of intensification. Streets having always stops have become thoroughfares with a result in decrease in pedestrian safety as a result of aggressive driving. The Toronto official plan requires a reduction in the dependency of the automobile. During an earlier meeting with a councillor and a member of the planning department, my question relating to the movement of people was disregarded. This is an example of a misapplication of the official plan and a blatant disregard for proactive comments from the citizens. I enjoy the Munich underground rail system that affords flexibility through numerous entry locations with several east-west and north-south routes without overcrowding and service interruptions. Numerous elevators are provided for people with disabilities. Investment in an advanced underground rail system is mandatory. Progressive annual additions and revolutionary changes are essential to combat traffic congestion and the reliance on the automobile. Toronto must retreat from its current course of tweaking the system to facilitate vehicular movement. European cities have been advancing rail systems for several decades. In conclusion, I recommend annual budget inclusions that oblige the city to progress annually with the addition of a specified length of underground rail. This will lead to a variety of both east-west and north-south lines to provide a network that will accommodate all citizens. Concurrently, the city must aggressively approach both the federal and provincial governments in discussions to obtain their, said, their solid commitment for essential funding which has been eroded in the past. The continual reduction of the federal corporate tax rate during a 52-year period and the provincial downloading of costs from the 1990s have severely burdened Toronto. This must be restored. Revenue tools that were recommended by city staff can be used immediately for the generation of funds. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity afforded by the committee for this presentation. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, I appreciate your time. Next is Eleonora Mara. Good evening. Um, I'm from Birch Cliff Public School. I run the nutrition program at uh, there. It's 400 students, and we're here to, um, to hopefully get more budget. I have 390 kids, and uh, we first got approached last year when I was doing lunchroom, and. Um, after watching the kids during lunch, seeing what they're eating, um, you know, a pita with cheese whiz. Um, I have these three kids, uh, two twins, a boy and a girl, a brother and a sister and an older girl, sister that um, they would eat rice, steamed rice, that's what they'd have. But then I would find them, when everyone would go out for recess, I'd stay back and clean up and one of the little boys would go in the garbage can and get food. This one of the brothers, the little sisters would pick up food 
So we started this program. Um, we're blessed that it's, you know, we have a mixed family, well-to-do, not. So um, we've gotten some help from the parents and um, we're just, it's really, really hard to feed these kids healthy, especially the amount that the Toronto Public Health wants us to feed with the budget that we have to work with. Um, we also ended up going to, um, it celebrated their 100th anniversary and we were there and we got a great feedback from the community there and um, we're just here to hope that maybe you guys can help us out. Questions? Councillor Davis. So how much do you spend per child on food? I'm trying to remember what... You um, mean per day? Per day. They're trying to say around 80 cents, maybe 90 cents, but I have to do a dairy, a grain, and a fruit or a vegetable. Um, but also I have gluten-free, I have to think of nut allergies, I have to think of dairy, all that. For 90 cents. 80, 90 cents, depends. Right. Now that's also me. So, so you raise money, H how much does your program get from this foundation for student success? It's done based every year, I guess. We, we or, or are you in the Catholic school no, system? No, I'm in the public school. In the public school system. Mm -hmm. So how much do you get for your program? Um, I'm not 100% sure how much we got this year, but every year we, we, um, we bid for it or something? Is it bidding? Application, sorry, an application that we fill out based on how many students we have. Right. And then that's how they figure and out. And then you money raise money. money on top of that. Um, so at the beginning of the year, I, 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 I sent out a form stating that we were going to re-initialize the nutrition program and we asked the parents if they can uh, give a donation based on what they can. So I've had some parents that can and some parents that obviously can't afford it, but it's offered to all the students. And how much uh, do you raise on top of what you get from this? Uh, got from about 3000 Okay. So okay, and you provide, that's a snack program or a lunch program? It's a morning program? meal, so it's, it's served before morning recess. Okay, a morning snack program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Frederickus. Oh, thanks very much, um, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Eleonora, how many students do you or students do you currently have in your program? Roughly about 390. 390 mm -hmm. out of a population of of the school. No, that's how many students I have. We serve everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. <coughs> thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Layton had a quick question. I'm, how long has the program been running for? So I started the pilot in last uh, June. We did it for that month, and then I started again in October full, full well, on. I was going to ask about inflation, but from year to year, you probably don't have a number yet. Thank no, you very much No, because actually now we're it. doing uh, the French immersion, so every year there'll be a s class, yeah. extra class started. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for, you. for making the effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah, are you ready? Did you want to depute now? I'm, I notice... It's no, it's fine. We, I, we just, we, we hear some quiet out in the hallway, so we probably have a good opportunity to, to speak. So why don't you, why don't you uh, come and then we'll, we'll continue with Caitlin next. Uh, thank you. Oh, and that was a text from my spouse saying he's calmed down, so everything's okay. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your patience. Um, my name is Sarah Earhart, and I've been living near Coxwell and Dundas since 2015. I'm a mother to 20-month-old Clarence, who you all met earlier this evening. Uh, the childcare and earlier situation in the east end of Toronto has hit crisis proportions. Insufficient licensed, high-quality spaces for the growing number of families in the area, prices well above the median for the city, and with the current proposal to cut uh, some of the subsidies for TDSB, that means it will become even more expensive for families in this community. And there's also no real information about what is being done to plan for adequate early childhood services for our growing community. The cuts currently being proposed to childcare and recreation under consideration in this budget will hurt Toronto's East End and take us in the wrong direction. 
In particular, the cuts to childcare subsidies, removal of the facility supports to TDSB for childcare spaces, and the withdrawal of recreation programs from S.H. Armstrong, Duke of Connaught Pool are all areas of concern. The cuts to pool programming in our neighborhood in particular is confusing to me. My son and I were lucky enough to get into swim classes this winter. I say lucky because all the swim programming in our neighborhood is waitlisted. In 2012, this council made the decision to keep our pool and I cannot understand how, with the baby boom taking place right now, we would get rid of this programming when the wait lists demonstrate it is in such high community demand. Our very own Olympic medalist, Penny Alexiuk, is a neighborhood role model for our children, yet we will be offering them fewer opportunities to try to swim like her. It is particularly tragic that the year of Canada's 150th anniversary will be remembered in East Toronto as the time recreational programming was cut. This goes against what we as residents want for our children and it goes against the city's own poverty reduction strategy. Being a lakeside community, it also goes against common sense safety considerations for our children. How can we expect other levels of government to be working with us to support our children if we ourselves are cutting back and downloading to TDSB at a time of obvious growth in young families in this neighborhood? This past year, parents in our community joined together under the banner Toronto East Enders for Child Care to demand action on these issues. We are a group of parents in Toronto's East End who are passionate about improving child care and early year services for children aged 0 to 12. We have three goals more high quality spaces in our neighborhood, an early years and child care system that is affordable for families, and better information about our child care centers. We see fair compensation for child care workers and low income families in our communities as going hand in hand with these goals. Sorry, adequate support for newcomers and low income families in our communities as going hand in hand with these goals. The current system is seriously broken. A freeze on child care subsidies in our community uh, the past closing of an East Toronto child care subsidy office, school overcrowding, insufficient in-school before and after school care, overcapacity parent-child resource centers in our neighborhoods and north of the Danforth in particular, long wait times for early childhood health specialists through Toronto Public Health, and a hands-off approach around child care planning and daycare waitlist management are only a few of the challenges that our community is facing as we attempt to access quality affordable child care and education opportunities. We are calling on all levels of government and our, our city and councillors through this budget in particular to make child care a priority in 2017 and to ensure that growing neighbourhoods like the Toronto's East End are prioritized in any efforts to enhance child care, early education and family services. We would ask that the budgets for child care supports and recreation programming including swimming for children be maintained in this budget. I and many other residents would be willing to pay more in property taxes to get the child care and recreation services a modern city like Toronto requires for all families to succeed. I would ask that the city go beyond this and look to actually take forward looking steps to improve the child care offerings across the city and in our East End neighbourhoods. A low cost but much needed start would be the creation of a consolidated child care wait list modelled off the successful online system in the city of Ottawa. I thank you for your time and for making child care and children's recreation programming a priority in this budget by maintaining budget levels in these crucial areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Fragadakis. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Sarah, you mentioned uh, better information as one of your group's goals, and I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that. Uh, thanks. I think uh, once you've actually managed to make it into the system, it's hard to know uh, information about the quality. Some of this I understand is a provincial level consideration, but even access to what's happening with the wait list, where before and after school care programming is available, where recreation programming is available, all of these are areas where I've found in, in working with uh, parents that are new to this neighborhood, they're having challenges. So one that we hear coming up frequently is around the wait lists. And so um, because I didn't live in Toronto when I first signed up for Toronto's waitlist. I signed up about a year and a half before I actually moved into the city. Uh, I also signed up for the city of Ottawa. And so I had the experience of going through both waitlist systems at the same time. And uh, I can say that having a consolidated system uh, was very helpful. Um, so what forward-looking steps would you suggest? I, I would suggest as a start uh, putting funding in this budget 
uh, for a consolidated waitlist system so that parents would only have to apply through their postal code and check off which places they would like to be waitlisted. Ideally, such a system could also let them know where they, they are in a rank order waitlist system or at a minimum the policies. I'd also suggest better information around subsidies. So for example, when I applied, uh, I also applied for the subsidy because at the time we were on a single income. However, we had to go in person to change uh, that situation, but there is no childcare subsidy office in the East York area anymore. We had to go either deep into Scarborough or we had to go to Young Street. And so as of now, I still have not had time to go and wait with my toddler to make changes to our subsidy application. So you mentioned this that is three years later. So you just mentioned that there's no office in East York anymore. Why was there one before? My understanding was that several years ago there was a subsidy office in like in the general area that was closed down due to budget cuts previously. And so again, it's I know we go year to year to fight to maintain, but really given the growth and what's happening in the, these neighborhoods, I think we really have to start to look forward in terms of what, what do we need to meet, meet demand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks for raising the question of the centralized wait list, and I've been madly looking for the motion that went through Council. And actually, um, I had the date wrong. Um, so there is going to be and should be uh, a report through the community development prior to the 2018 budget process on developing a centralized wait list. So you made that really clear. Uh, okay. and That's so great to hear. We'll have to pursue that to make sure that happens. Um, <coughs> but the other question, Councillor um, Burnside uh, raised questions, and I think so did Councillor Crawford, about the question of childcare centers that are not school-based and is it fair to be subsidizing uh, parents in school-based child care center by paying more to cover the rental costs or the occupancy costs than uh, without subsidizing the, those that are based in other facilities other than schools? How, what would you say about that? Um, I, I'd say it's really hard to talk about fairness in the child care system here given uh, how few subsidies are available for the number of families uh, that require them uh, and given the huge fees. So for me, who I'm not in a, in a, a school run, I, I am still waitlisted and I'm waiting for care for my 20 month old son and I've been on the waitlist since fall of 2014 and have not as yet received a call back for any of the school based daycares, but I would gladly make sure that others in my community are able to continue to receive um, any base reductions in fees that they can access. I mean, I, I believe that we should go further and, and offer supports through all levels of government for all of our children in childcare, but at a bare minimum, I think we should keep what's, what's happening. It's the, the consequences for families that have budgeted for those costs, I think, uh, would be significant. In other words, we might look at actually providing more funding to those child care centers that currently don't have some kind of base funding that covers the rental costs if we're going to look at fairness. If, uh, yes, I, yeah. I would say go that direction, but, but I would also gladly, I, I don't see there being a fairness issue with, with having that kind of subsidy in place. I think it's excellent that there is a kind of subsidy to make sure that our schools can continue to serve as community hubs for things like community service programming, parent-child centers, for pools and recreation facilities, and also for child care locations. Mm -hmm. um, so the provincial funding formula doesn't recognize child care in schools, and it doesn't recognize school pools. I don't think it recognizes lunch rooms. I mean, there are a number of things. So it is a provincial problem, and there are people who will suggest that the, uh, the funding ought to come from the province uh, more broadly. Is your organization also going to press uh, your provincial representatives uh, to fund uh, child care better? Yeah, uh, we, yes we are. Uh, and we have sent letters to all levels of government for their 2017 budget processes, uh, <coughs> saying very much a similar thing. And as, as a parent, but also as a taxpayer to all three levels of government, I think it's, uh, to me, it's, it's the same money. So uh, as to who pays, for me, 
<laughs> it's hard to, to advocate or perceive, but certainly at all levels of government, there's the economic rationale, there's a social rationale uh, for making investments in childcare. And so we would urge that we, at a minimum, maintain what's already there. And, and also that it's hard to work with the other levels of government when we start pulling funding, especially from TDSB, which doesn't have the ability to raise revenue. So uh, the more we download things onto TDSB, the more it's going to impact families in this community because they're not in a position to, uh, uh, to balance their books. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Next is Caitlin Cassie. Hi there, good evening. Uh, my name is Caitlin Cassie. I live on the Danforth and I'm here to speak as a concerned resident of Toronto. Let me start by saying that every year we seem to be having a lot of the same conversations. In the lead up to the budget getting passed, there's discussion about what is getting cut, what is being spared, and how these cuts will disproportionately hurt its most vulnerable residents. We talk about transit and housing and how Toronto needs more revenue tools, how property taxes need to be raised above the rate of inflation, how the TTC is the least subsidized transit system in Canada, etc. I think some people are discouraged from coming to these meetings because it's the same old conversations and there does not seem to be a lot of movement on any of these issues. But I'm here today because I do not believe that this budget process is the same old, same old. Every year, the context in which the city makes a budget, allocating its operating and capital expenditures is different. In particular, in November 2015, just over a year ago, the city unanimously voted the poverty reduction strategy into existence, as people here already spoke to today. This council made a commitment to reduce poverty in the city. It took a year to make that strategy, or maybe even longer. Days and days of consultations and tireless advocacy inside and outside the government. So how can a city council that has officially committed to reducing poverty be having discussions about cuts that disproportionately hurt its most vulnerable residents? That does not add up and that does not make sense. The six main issues included in the poverty reduction strategy are housing stability, service access, transit equity, food access, quality jobs and livable wages, and systemic change. And yet, these are precisely the areas that are being threatened by cuts or stymied by inaction. Other reasons that the two seven, pardon me, 2017 budget process is not the same as every other year. Shooting deaths were up by 54% last year. We lost far too many lives in this city. Last summer, the Toronto Youth Equity Strategy and the Toronto Youth Cabinet organized a town hall meeting at City Hall. Not one councillor attended that meeting, and the representative from the mayor's office looked like he was falling asleep, and then he left halfway through that meeting. That was inexcusable. We also have two elections coming up in 2018 at the municipal and provincial levels and a new-ish federal government. So no, this is not the same as every other year and I think this council needs to recognize the context in which we are operating as a city more explicitly and it also needs to get a lot better at making connections between policy, process and impact. The city does a lot of tremendous things. I'm very proud of the City of Toronto for a number of reasons. Off the top of my head, I would like to highlight 311, the Youth Engagement Strategy, TO Core, the library system. People work extremely hard for this city. From youth recreators up in Driftwood to the people running seniors programming in Malvern, people are working hard to make good on the city's commitment to create an inclusive and safe environment for everyone from every background at every stage in their life. But the connections are not being made be between the commitments made in strategies passed by council and the observable impact of these strategies on people's lives. There's, there's a disconnection between the proactive policies you commit to and the proposed budget cuts you are debating. The civic tech community and Better Budget TO have made huge strides to democratize these processes, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, my friend told me today about one initiative that is being led outside of government. It's called budgetpedia.ca, and it's one of these attempts to democratize these processes. Policy needs to be made from a people-centered perspective. When hundreds of hours are spent making strategies, we need a way to hold the city accountable to the commitments it's made. Strategies advocate for kids and youth to be more involved, for example. But signing up your kids for sports camps on the city website is not user-friendly, it's not people-centered. It's a nightmare. Another example is the great work the Toronto Youth Equity Strategy Team is doing. But how is data being gathered to track progress and show areas that still need more attention? How is this data being visualized? Can I go to the city's website and pull up a map that will show me how funding is being allocated across the city, to which neighborhoods, to which community centers? How is ties responding to the increase in gun violence? A lot of questions are being left unanswered. The city needs to be more open to speaking to people on the ground who are doing the work in the neighborhoods, and it needs to engage the civic tech community more deliberately to make processes more inclusive and transparent. 
Data, when used effectively, is an important means to an impactful end. Yes, it's very difficult to demonstrate impact, but we need to make more concerted efforts. Policy processes can and need to be democratized. People want access, people want to be included, people have ideas, listen to them. You have to get at people where they are and not always expect people to come to you. If you live in Rexdale and you're taking TTC, it can take two hours one way to get down to City Hall to depute. So that will take your entire day. So that's just not reasonable. The budget meetings around the city are a good uh, start. So in conclusion, please recognize that this budget process is not just about cost accounting and revenues and expenditures. It's about making decisions that directly affect people's lives and livelihoods. Moreover, the budget that the city commits to is a further extension of the story the city is trying to tell. Are we, as a, city, are we a city that cares about its most vulnerable residents, or are we a city that makes a bunch of promises it does not intend to keep? I, for one, hope it's the former. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Layton, any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Cass. You were right on there. If you could just walk outside and say that exact same thing to CP24, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're being serious or not. No, I'm <laughs> totally serious. <laughs> I will go out and read your story today. They're on live on air now, so I can't. Question to counsel, you're part of quorum, so you can't leave the room. Uh, next is I Reverend. Did, I did want to ask you a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Davis wanted to um, ask a question. I absolutely agree with my colleague here. Um, I experienced the same frustration. We passed strategies and policies, and then where's the beef? Like, where's the meat? Um, which policies in particular do you think that we have not been held to account on, and how do you think we should be held to account in a more, in, in a better way? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned a couple in my deputation. Um, poverty reduction strategy, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, I think a social planning TO has come up with an article that says proposed cuts right now would be another $76 million uh, to the city's most vulnerable residents. That's not even counting the cuts that might be proposed. Uh, so there's like, you know, that, that's one aspect. Uh, I do a lot of work in the community with youth and children. Uh, so looking at the uh, Toronto Youth Equity Strategy. So that's again, the, the city's most vulnerable youth. It's, it's great people working on it, and I'm so excited about that work. They have town hall meetings. Um, the initiatives are fantastic, but it's like you, you have people working on it. You have a dedicated team, but where are the results and where are the impacts? And I know that's difficult, but it needs to be an end-to-end -end process because when we're talking about you know marginalized youth or all these different terms that get bandied about, it's like you have people who are spatially segregated that have poor transit, um, you know, living in social housing, and then we're looking at all these different strategies overlaid one on top of another, and we aren't able to compare uh, this data and this funding and you know I've even read articles that say you, you like there's a lack of record being kept on which community centers are getting which funding yeah. so that data needs to be kept and we need to be able to see the results would you be surprised I have in 13 years not been able to get the budget for what is spent on recreation in my ward that is really it's impossible yes yes exactly <laughs> Um, and the priority neighborhoods work. I mean, trying to figure out exactly what are the outcomes of the priority neighborhoods work and the amount of city resources that have been targeted to address those identified gaps. Have you looked at that at all? I, I mean, I know United Way's done a ton of work. I know that priority neighborhoods are now neighborhood improvement areas. Um, I, I also don't want to come across as though I think that that is the answer to all the questions. Uh, I think, yeah. like I said, it's a means to an end. Uh, we can look to New York City. They have the New York, the mayor's data office. I know the City of London is also working uh, in close conjunction with Nesta, an innovation organization there, um, looking at how we, they can use data to do better for the city and for its people. So, um, I mean, priority neighborhoods, it's also that's stigmatizing in a way. Uh, you know, there was a deputation at the meeting last week I went to, and a woman, you know, very adeptly said, you know, I'm called low income or I'm called high priority, and every other week I'm called some, like, you know, different budgets, I'm called different things. So uh, yes, we need uh, we need to be looking at the most vulnerable residents and how the city is, is working hard for them, but we need to have these policies and these strategies speak to one another. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Reverend Robert Wardlaw. Christina, who's out in the hall, I've got your live hit for uh, 730, CP24, I've got your next interview right here. <laughs> Cassie here. Thank you, Reverend. Kate, I'm sorry, Cassie. Caitlin. 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 Cassie, sorry. Reverend, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good evening and uh, Happy New Year. 
to you all. I'm at a United Church that's due south of here on Girard, the corner of Coxville. And it has a, an elaborate food ministry that is over 30 years old. <coughs> I meet, most Wednesdays I meet with people who, at the food bank downstairs. And what impresses me is the courage it takes to walk into a church basement and confess to somebody that you have nothing where you never thought you would be in this situation. You're now asking strangers for food. I know some people don't come. They're just too embarrassed. They, they will not make that uh, little trip into the, into the church. Those who come look like the proverbial deer in the, in the headlights the first time they come. It, it is a horrible experience. I, I trust you never have had it. I have been very fortunate not to have had it, and I pray that no one has to do that uh, who's here tonight. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to walk into a, a food bank and say, help me. Uh, we serve between 250 and 300 people a week in 300 minutes, one a minute. So it's noisy, it's crowded, uh, it's unpleasant, people are not happy to be there. It's not a good, charity is just a bad way to, to, do, to look after our lowest income people. I, I can't think of other parts of, of our society where we depend on people's giving to make sure that the most vulnerable are, are looked after. We usually tax each other, but not enough, as everyone has been saying. Um, the star today was pointing out that CEO incomes have doubled in the last, is it, 12 or 15 years, and the rest of us have gone up something like 9%. The, the, the gap is, is big and growing, and it's unpleasant. And it could be that we can do something about that as a city. I know there are other levels of government, I, I get that. But it, it seems to me if the budget committee members had the courage, the same courage it takes to walk into a food bank, the courage to go to the rest of the executive and council and say, let's invest. Let's be ready to go back to the electorate in 18, have the courage to go to them and say, we are making important investments in one another. I think that would be a good match. If you need to see the courage, by all means, come to our food bank, any food bank, any time, and hang out with somebody who knows and, and, and go and talk to a first timer and see the guts that it takes to, to do that. And then bring that to the executive, to council, and then all of you bring it to the electorate and say, listen, you're the majority, you elect us, but we need to look after the minority who, who can't outvote you and who depend on all these services that people have been referencing uh, this evening, and I'm sure this afternoon too, and at all the other budget consultations, in all the other places, and all the other years. Uh, we're in this together, and we need to have the capacity as leaders to say that to the rest of the people. This is important. It matters. <laughs> you can choose not to elect me, but I stand with the people who can least stand for themselves. Thank you. Councillor Fregadakis. Oh, oh, I wasn't going to ask a question. I just wanted to thank him very much for what he's doing uh, for Glen Rhodes United Church, uh, through the church, for the people in the, in the neighborhood, because I had the privilege to serve Christmas dinner um, at the food bank at Pape and Cosburn a few days before Christmas. And um, I saw the need. The need was tr is tremendous in in, uh, in the East End, and I expect it's the same all across the city. And I just wanted to say thank you so much you um, for uh, for offering up your church as one of the sites for the food bank. Every, every person who leaves the food bank and passes me thanks me effusively. I'm the person who does the least. The volunteers do all the work. Somehow I receive the thanks. The congregation raises about eighteen thousand dollars a year, and. We did the arithmetic on what it would cost to fund that if we paid people and paid for groceries. And the budget uh, a couple of years ago was $350,000, running on an $18,000 donated amount. So the city is getting tremendous value from that, but I still object to charity being the way it's handled. It's 14,000 pampers a year, uh, 1,200 meals a year, uh, or, or I think maybe 2,000 meals a year, uh, running on a pittance. But I'm not here mainly to talk about food. I'm, I'm here to talk about every other kind of social service. We'll, we'll keep doing that as long as we have to. We really want change to come. 
I, I'll be talking to Arthur Potts on Friday, and I really hope that uh, the provincial government gets serious about social assistance and does something so that the lowest income people have a little more than they do now. It's just horrible. Well, well, thanks very much. I know that uh, the, the churches and all the other faith community, the faith community in general, just um, picks up where the city and other governments um, drop off. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Davis. Um, I was <laughs> pleased to hear you are going to meet with um, yeah. our MPP, and I said the same thing at council last month that we can't have a poverty strategy that doesn't include the provincial government to commit to raising the basic needs allowance as part of social assistance. So is there an ask you are making along with others to raise the basic um, There's There's something called allowance. the Interfaith Social Assistance Reform Coalition. Okay. Uh, people of different faiths, many faiths from all over the province. And we decided this year we would ask for a billion dollars in the provincial budget. 700,000 to raise rates, social assistance rates, and 300,000 to do other things that will support very low income people uh, in important ways that are not direct money to them but will make a huge difference in their lives. So that's okay, the ask, that's is a, a billion. And that's yeah. the Interfaith? Social, S I S A R C, Interfaith Social Assistance Reform Coalition. Reform Coalition. And that's a little less than 1% of the provincial budget, which is around 120 billion, something like that. Councillor, I, I don't mean for this to come across as sarcastic because in fact it's very it's very saddening, but I hope that that you have a lot of faith and and and, and power in the Almighty that you'd think that uh, that that council in an election year 2018 uh, would in fact consider actually doing what was right and and trying to communicate that to their constituents that we need to raise taxes in order to provide for everyone in our community. I have faith in your faith. And so so p please don't stop all of your hard work um, on both accounts, both uh, with uh, with the food ministry and uh, in, in, um, in in helping us all see see some kind of light here. Ladies and gentlemen, have, have courage. Have the courage Thank to you. act. Thank you, Reverend. Next is Anthony Sheen. Anthony Sheen. Sheen? Okay, Sheen. Next is Mariana Lucci. Luwicki. Thank you. It's, it's, it's never fun being the person between here and the adjournment. <laughs> But we have, anyways, we have, yes. we have two more people, so you're not. Oh, you're not sorry. Yeah, okay, two more even better. Here. Okay, um, so I, I, my name's Marianna Lewecki. I'm the president of the Park Vista Tenants Association, and unsurprisingly, I'm here to represent tenants. I'm a resident of Ward 31, and I certainly did see Mary Fragedakis and uh, Janet on the Tenant Issues Committee, and I saw John Burnside and Thorncliffe at a meeting for tenants. And I do know from looking at your voting record that. All you know, you you were all part of the 35 to 4 vote to uh, support uh, new rules for uh, tenants. And so, how did we get to the situation of needing new rules for tenants? I often go into my little speech about how the word itself, landlord, might imply uh, you know an imbalance of power. And that's what we've certainly found as tenants is that it's not some nice Downton Abbey-like existence where, despite you know disparity in wealth that people are treated as equals and everything's wonderful and things get taken care of. That's why the new rules are brought in. It's not a big amount of money, it's 5.2 million. I know one of the more contentious things on that vote was increasing the FTEs from 12 to six. And I know some of the members here did not uh, vote for that. But I know that the executive director will be making a presentation and hopefully they will you know, give some uh, good reasons on how they think the program can work and how it can work under the funding. But, you know, it's, it's you know, I've been an attendant for a while, uh, seen change in ownership and seen a dramatic increase in how things can change. Uh, I, you know, I, here's how I spent part of my holiday. Canadian Tire had a flyer where there was a sale on thermometers, so I was rushing down to the Canadian Tire at uh, Leslie and uh, Lakeshore because they had run out so that people could take temperatures, take a log, and then call the city if it wasn't meeting the minimum 21 degrees. 
I mean, heat is a basic thing that people should have. They shouldn't have to fight for it. It's sad that I'm the person there telling them, this is your right, if it doesn't work, here's, here's a thermometer, here's a log, and you know, if that, you contact the landlord, if it doesn't help, then you call the city. But that person at the city has to be there to help them. I mean, our association in the building I live in, it's about 108 units. Our membership fee for the Tenants Association is about $10 a year. So based on one month's income, I would have to get the equivalent from an annual membership for more than 100 years to match what the landlord's taking in from a month. And that's, that's not a good level for me to start from, from my budgeting to try to fight for these people. Uh, they were hit with above guideline increases in 2015. It was a 4.6% increase to the rent. 2016, it's a 5% increase. Next year, it will be a 1.9%. So we are struggling as well as tenants. Uh, there is guidelines theoretically in the province, but they're often exceeded. So you, you, know, you are part of this momentous vote, 35 to 4, to bring in rules, better inform, better protect tenants. You have to finish the job. Make sure it gets done, make sure those resources are there, and, and make sure that tenants, which I often think of as sort of the unseen majority or the easily forgotten majority, you know, are, get the protection that they deserve. There's often a lot of focus on uh, people who own property. I take it they vote in greater you know, rates, but you do have to protect those people that are working two or three jobs and often don't have the opportunity to come out to events like this to talk about why such protection is important. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Next is uh, Anita Khanna. No, I just want to recognize Mayor Tori in the, office, or in the uh, audience too who's listening. So welcome, Mayor Tori. <coughs> welcome, Anita. You'll have five minutes. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'm a parent and I'm a worker in the not-for-profit sector in Toronto. I volunteer with community agencies that receive city grant funding and I am proud to live in East York. This is my third budget deputation since 2010, but this is my first one as a parent. Being a parent opens your eyes in a new way to hope and possibility. It's unexpected and it's wonderful. Being a parent in Toronto also opens your eyes to inequality in a new and profound way. From my own experience, the costs of commuting, housing, bills, childcare uh, are nearly impossible to afford. For families in poverty, the struggle to find solid ground and provide opportunities and basic necessities, simply healthy food, as we heard from so many people here today, uh, are a constant challenge. And frankly, uh, a parent's worst nightmare is to be unable to afford to care and to provide for their child. For us, childcare is particularly vital. Allowing my partner and I to stay employed, contribute to our communities, and to, to build careers uh, and, and hope for a better future, we contribute to the arts and to anti-poverty research. Childcare is even more important for our daughter who learns new skills or words each and every day. It was important to access high quality and regulated childcare in a not-for-profit center our, our daughter goes uh, to a Wood Green Community Services Child Care Center uh, and she's in the infant room. We pay full fees, over $2,000 a month, uh, just $50 less than the cost of our mortgage. Child care allows us to work and it allows for our daughter to grow in profound ways. We believe that all children should have this opportunity and have access to such affordable regulated care not just those who are in the middle or high income. There's clearly a need. We have 18,000 children on the subsidy waiting list in the city. We need to grow childcare funding. We need to respond to progress in the baby boom that others have spoken about today. Cutting subsidies and passing on more fees to families in the city, in this city, which has the highest childcare fees in Canada, should not be considered. It's a ludicrous proposition and one that's contributing to the crisis on the ground in every neighborhood and every, uh, every ward in this city. In November, we were reminded of how unequal the city of Toronto is. Almost 30% of children here live in poverty. It is that fact and reports you know, from 2014 that inspired all mayoral candidates to pledge to, to work towards an anti-poverty strategy 
This council has passed such a strategy. We have commitments. What we need is the action and the investments to back up uh, to back up and to and to, to take take the action that's needed to eliminate poverty. In my own neighborhood, uh, the child poverty rate hovers around 30 percent. If I go one way or one sub subway stop east to Vic Park, almost 60 percent of children in the neighborhood bordering Vic Park live in poverty. These children are in families in poor quality housing. Uh, with landlords that are inattentive or TCHC that is not meeting their needs, and they rely on food banks. Recent data show that 40% of children living in poverty in Canada have parents who work full time, full year. They can't lift themselves out of poverty. Families on social assistance receive a pittance. Their poverty is legislated. They're punished despite turning to assistance due to illness or a death in the family, uh, a family breakup or job loss. Toronto needs to do more for its most vulnerable residents. We certainly cannot cast away one in four children to the scourge of poverty. We need proactive city planning, investment, and action to level the playing field for children and to make poverty history. The city budget needs to bolster investments in anti-poverty programs and meet the commitments made in the strategy. In particular, Council cannot cut housing and shelter workers who help people off the streets and into homes. We can't flatline funding to community grants and agencies and services in all wards in this city that build our communities and address the needs of residents from a, the prenatal stage to seniorhood. These programs provide food, care, support, they fight racism, homophobia, and sexism, and they build a stronger, more tolerant city, the city that we all hope to move to if we're not from here, and the one that we're proud to call home when we do live here. As a divided city, Toronto can't thrive. Toronto has the most millionaires and the highest child poverty rate in Canada. We need to look ourselves in the mirror. We can't let children down when we have the tools and the ability to raise revenue and invest in their futures. I urge City Council to take the, the action that's necessary to eliminate child poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, Councillor Ragadakis has some questions. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Anita, for your presentation. I was wondering if, uh, if there's a model from another Canadian city that you think we should seek to emulate. Uh, certainly. I would say that, uh, that we've seen great commitments from uh, Calgary, for example. So Mayor Nenshi's uh, work to end homelessness, uh, the low-income uh, transit uh, fare system there is exceptional. Um, as well, Edmonton has taken some really strong proactive steps. I think uh, Toronto backing up uh, the strategy and uh, its plan in place with targeted steps and maintaining funding in each budget moving forward will be a key a, a key way for us to, to sort of match and hopefully exceed and progress past some of the examples within Canada. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Um, thank you very much for your um, submission and I you're paying over 2000 a month for child care. I am. Um, <coughs> is that a school-based child care center, or is it in a standalone? It's in a standalone facility. facility. It's operated by Wood Green at Maine and Girard. And there's been some suggestion that it's not fair mm -hmm. uh, that the city is providing for the occupancy costs of school-based child care centers mm -hmm. um, and not those that aren't in schools. Um, do you think that's unfair, and or do you think <coughs> there's other way? There are other ways we might address uh, the equity issue. Well, certainly we have a, a problem with based childcare funding in the city, and we need to enhance based childcare funding. Uh, we have a plan, I believe, that has been in place or mapped out. We need to to ensure that we're meeting those commitments and and uh, enhancing the funding. I, you know. I understand from my own research that uh, eliminating the support for the school-based centers that the city currently provides will raise costs to families to the tune of $350 a year. That would put my child care costs if I was, if, you know, uh, with my current rates, uh, $2,550 a year. $350 is a big deal to people. And yeah, we, we budget, you know, every month, every two weeks, you know, $5 here, $10 there. 
Three hundred and fifty dollars passed on to people. I, I think, huh? and it's much it's much more than the cost of How raising. How much do you pay a year? Uh, well, the price just went up uh, in January with inflation, so it's twenty one hundred uh, for infant care in this room. Uh, okay, but it's multiplied by twelve, it's mind boggling. Uh, I think seven times the cost of university tuition, uh, but certainly vital for us to be able to go to work and uh, contribute to our community. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Laker. Thank you very much. Built into the budget um, is uh, um, is in, into the social development finance and administration budget is foregoing the two percent inflationary <coughs> increase. These are grants that go to any number of different types of organizations yeah. for delivering services uh, to vulnerable residents in our city, um, uh, the indiscriminate of age, uh, but but certainly uh, programs that people rely on. Do you think that that should be considered a, a, a minor uh, adjustment to the budget that that won't impact the service levels of those organizations uh, that that those organizations are able to achieve? Uh, certainly, that's not a minor cut. So something in the neighborhood of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I understand from again my own research, is uh, is certainly significant. And I've I've worked in the nonprofit sector in Toronto for over ten years er, er, at agencies in, of various size, and uh, I've seen what thirty thousand dollars of funding from the Access and Equity Grant, from the CPIP uh, grouping of grants can do for a community. I understand and have seen. Uh, Tamil seniors and Pakistani um, youth, you know, sort of uh, building community in places where there has been high conflict. Uh, I work at an agency now that is able to provide funding, uh, or rather uses the funding from the city to address revitalization issues in Florence Heights community. We also provide counseling to the LGBTQ community and uh, fill gaps um, that are many within the city. And it's really that CPIP funding and that grant money that allows agencies like ours and like other ones I've worked to to leverage additional funds, funds from other levels of government. So they say that one dollar invested in CPIP leverages uh, ten additional dollars from other levels of government. City grants uh, help small agencies. I've worked at you know agencies with two hundred and fifty thousand dollar budgets. Uh, you know, sort of keep the lights on and uh, you know maintain viability in the eyes of a place like citizenship and immigration Canada or or other federal funders and certainly you know all levels of government have a role to play in supporting community services for newcomers and vulnerable people but uh, the city is a crucial linchpin in ensuring that we have a city that functions and that isn't as starkly divided as it certainly would be without city services do you think our city invests enough in, in frontline workers to address um, uh, address poverty and housing issues? Certainly not. Uh, from my own experience of the, uh, the hard work and the personal toll that I know that it takes, especially on people who have uh, themselves a lived experience of being homeless or uh, receiving um, social assistance or living or sleeping rough, uh, certainly um, the, the, the compensation levels, those kinds of things, like for many people, they have stable employment within the city. Uh, but for others, they are pre more precariously employed. Uh, they, they might be on a temporary basis. They might have limited hours. I know, I know colleagues or rather friends who work for 311 and, you know, are, are working hard for, you know, five or, or six years in hopes of becoming permanent, but <laughs> keep getting rollover contracts and those types of things. So I think it's, it's certainly, you know, from my experience as an avid library user, I go to the main square, you know, Main Square Community Center, go swimming, all that kind of stuff. It's those workers and that commitment uh, to quality services and really to uh, to ensuring that we can access the resources within the city that, that is the difference uh, from living here to living in uh, another city. I think certainly that good wages, benefits, and, and support for workers is the direction we need to go into, especially to meet our poverty reduction goals. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last uh, deputant for the evening is uh, Jessica Diamond. It's uh, always good to go last when everybody's tired at the end of a long day. <laughs> I will do my very best to be brief. 
Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm here as a single parent of two young children aged five and six who are enrolled at Gledhill Avenue Child Care Center and also as the uh, chair of the board of directors of that same center. Uh, and I want to talk to you today about the school board operating grant and the proposal to eliminate it as well as child care subsidies. The lease costs that result from the termination of the school board operating grant could amount to a total annual increase of up to $18,000 uh, in the uh, center's budget this year. So that's about 2% of our operating, uh, just under. The GACC's budget has already been submitted to the City of Toronto for review without these costs incorporated because we didn't know uh, that this proposal was coming forward. So this means that the per diems that are paid for subsidized children may not recognize these costs in this calendar year. As we're a nonprofit and we can't operate with a deficit, full fee paying families will be forced to bear the entirety of this cost. Preliminary calculations show that the impact on full fee paying families, uh, such as Anita, uh, who just spoke, in the preschool program could be almost $100 per month, an increase of 10% over, in over their existing fees. In the school age program, the increase could mean an in additional $84 per month for the summer program, an increase of 11% over the established 2017 summer fee at our center. For a family in my situation with two children in the school age program, this means a cost of $1,700 a month instead of $1,540. $170 that could go towards a mortgage payment or food costs or something fun to do as a family during the summer. Instead, it will go to paying rent in a public school that my provincial and property tax dollars are already currently supporting. As a center, We've gone through some challenging times in the last year. We've had to increase our fees to families across the board to make ends meet, and we know from this experience that families struggle to manage any increase at all to their fees. Even if the per diems for subsidized children recognize the cost, we would still be looking at $70 per month or 7% increase to the preschool program in light of our current reduced enrollment. Full enrollment could potentially bring that down to $44 a month or $2 a day. You'll note that's still higher than the $1.50 that per space quoted in the media earlier this week. If the Board of Directors needed to find $18,000 in year, we know from our recent experience that our program would be at imminent risk of decreased enrollment, which could lead and did lead to staff layoffs and ultimately reductions to available childcare in the community. Simply put, additional fee reductions may see parents seek unlicensed care or care in centers that are not located in schools and are therefore unaffected by this change. Our center has already felt the impact of city reductions. This year, our preschool room enrollment was drastically impacted by the freeze on subsidies. The center usually has a 60-40 split between unsubsidized and subsidized spaces. But in the preschool room this year, that swung to a 75-25 split. And we were unable to raise our public fee enrollment any higher, which has meant we've laid off staff and reduced hours just to stay afloat. I understand the move to increase the number of licensed spaces, but our experience has been that families in our community struggle to afford it. They desperately need these subsidies to increase as well, or those new spaces may well sit vacant. At least until a better solution is found, we're asking that you maintain the school board occupancy grant and increase subsidies so that more families in our community can access quality affordable childcare. I heard the suggestion earlier that the city should not subsidize care for families not receiving subsidies, but what's being proposed here today has exactly the opposite effect. So families that are not receiving subsidy will then subsidize the care of subsidized families twice. They'll subsidize it through their property tax, they'll subsidize it through their provincial tax, and then they'll subsidize it again because we can't pass that fee along in any other way. Uh, so. All the while, a lot of the families that are full fee families are waiting for subsidies. They're part of those 18,000 that are waiting desperate for some relief and we're just going to continue to increase the fees. So while this isn't a scenario where it's a huge amount of money for our center, $20,000 or 2% of our budget, it is a huge amount of money for the families that it has an impact on. It makes a difference. Don't think for a second that this million dollars isn't going to affect the lives of, of the people that you serve uh, and that we collectively serve in our roles. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Councillor Davis. Um, one of the, um, so one of the um, 
challenge has, has been that we shouldn't subsidize, and you've addressed that partially, we shouldn't subsidize the families who are in school-based child care. Uh, and you've mentioned, as did the previous speaker, direct funding. Um, there could be other ways to um, harmonize uh, and to ensure that there was equitable subsidizing of the operating costs. Um, because you currently get a new base funding grant this year as a result of the changes to the funding formula, correct? We do indeed. So the, the suggestion that we don't currently subsidize care for families that are not directly in receipt yes. of child care subsidies is false. Uh, is. There's, a, there's an operating grant mm -hmm. that, uh, that is currently received by child care centers right. that's a general operating grant and we use that grant as, as the board of directors and our right. administration at the center to determine exactly how we're going to distribute the funding across all of our families to make things easier. It's not just you know, the 40% the of families that are in receipt of subsidy are, are somehow getting a, a, a higher quality lunch. We're all getting the same food, we're getting the same programming, we have the same quality staff. Yeah, and this new um, direct funding, well, it's not new, it's old, but all of the provincial government has changed the funding stream, and in fact, I think it's been identified everywhere that the way to address affordability is to increase the base funding. Um, in, in terms of a basic operating grant to help keep fees affordable for all families. Isn't that kind of the, the debate right now? I think it is the debate right now, and I think, there's, I think there's a lot to be said for that theory. I think the challenge that we have uh, in, in our center and in, and in many other centers, I would imagine, is that uh, when you subsidize the base, <laughs> we are able then to pull up the quality of the entire center. If we were relying on money that we get solely from city subsidy, that money is calculated on a per diem based on a 90, 98% enrollment rate, an enrollment rate that in fact we haven't reached in a number of years that we're unlikely to reach uh, in the next five years or so. And consequently, what's intended to be a close to full and not yet full subsidization uh, for children that are coming from low income families is in fact already a deficit. So we are already attempting to balance our books and mitigate across the entirety of the pot. Uh, and so I, I think you know, to, to separate out the two streams and think that there is no cross-subsidization is, is a falsehood. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lee. So, so what you just said at, at, at the end there, I think it's very, very important that full fee paying parents are important to the mix of, of these child care centers. Absolutely. Because that's how, that's how you make it balance out. That's, that's right. Day. So if full fee parents are leaving because we drive up the cost, and it just becomes uh, a little bit cheaper to have a nanny or it actually you save money by just having one parent stay home, uh, that, that is a fear that uh, you could start, start losing the mix. And in fact, you just mentioned that you had. And we did. Yeah. So, so this year we had to increase our fees significantly. We, we discovered some liabilities that existed from a previous administration. And in the process of trying to mitigate those liabilities, uh, we ended up having to raise our fees close to 20% across the board. And in doing so, we lost a, a number of our full fee paying parents. Consequently, and at the same time, we lost uh, because of the subsidy freeze in the preschool room in our ward, we lost our ability to uh, bring in subsidized families to our preschool room. And as we watched uh, full fee paying families migrate out and no new subsidies come in, we saw the balance shift and we were unable to introduce any additional fee increase while simultaneously not being able to operate. So I think each child care center uh, would be likely to tell you that they can't operate solely on subsidy. Uh, because the subsidy calculation doesn't support full operating fees, uh, and we need both. And if we drive out our full fee paying parents, we simply cannot afford to sustain. So we heard earlier today that the, the school occupancy grant was around $6.50 per square foot, but that when, 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 that, when the, de the deal with the city has, is, ends, that potentially we could see, or probably on average, a rise to eleven twenty, eleven fifty a square foot. So the calculations that I gave you today uh, are based on $11 a square foot, and without 
tossing my good friends at the TDSB Child Care Center <laughs> under the bus, I did call the Toronto District School Board and ask them, what would it look like for us? How much would it be? And $11 a square foot was the number that I, I got from the person that I spoke to. Um, and we costed based on that. Uh, so not all of our rooms are uh, covered under the umbrella agreement. Some of them are not. But of the ones that are covered, so we would pay $11. And what I said was, could is there some potential to mitigate that back to the 650? Is there some potential uh, for the TDSB to waive some portion of it or to introduce it incrementally? And the response that I got was, it's not likely because the 650 doesn't cover their operating costs and they can't balance their books. So we would need to pay $11 just to cover what it costs them to provide maintenance service in those rooms. Okay, so if, and if I got, if I had you correct, if I had you correct, um, you've got about a 60-40 split? We do. So, they, and the city average is 36% subsidy uh, in spaces now. So, would it surprise you, and I'm gonna try to say this really slowly because it, can, it confuses me every time I think about it, that to save 1.4 million, um, if we were, the costs are gonna go up to 2.4 million because of the increase in the, the charge back from the T TDSB. And then if the city, if the city pays for the operating subsidy of those 37.6% of parents, if, if, <laughs> but if they do, which is likely that they would, likely that I'm, I have it on authority that they would, however, it's still an if, I get that. But if they do, then the city's gonna be paying 900,000 back. So in order to save $500,000, the city's gonna lift this agreement, allow for a doubling of cost, and actually charge parents one, full fee paying parents are gonna pay 1.4 million now that they weren't paying yesterday, and to save $500,000 for, for the first six months. Next year, that number would be $3 million that parents aren't paying today which will save the city a million dollars. Do you think that that's a really good return on investment for, um, for, for the savings that we get, given the cost? No, and I would suggest to you, my, my background is, uh, is in social work and child welfare, and I would suggest to you that as you drive those full fee paying parents out of centers by way of raising and increasing their costs, there's a social cost to what happens when those kids get placed in unlicensed childcare centers, when they get placed in unofficial babysitting arrangements with their neighbors, when they get placed uh, in, in less monitored scenarios with less oversight. The movement towards placing children in licensed childcare and increasing the number of licensed childcare spaces is because we know based on the evidence that licensed childcare is better for kids. So if we believe as a collective community that licensed childcare is better for kids, we need to do everything we can not to disincentivize that system. Thank you. I just, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm, tr I'm a little confused with all the numbers here, so I'm just gonna maybe ask similar to what Councillor Layton was doing, but I'm just gonna try to do it in a different way that makes a little more sense to me. So right now, the TD, we, we give a grant to the TDSB that pays for the rent for your daycare center, <coughs> which works out to be the equivalent of, is it 615 or 650 an hour? No. So right now, the city pays an operating grant to the TDSB that mm -hmm. pays for the rent of some of our space. Not all of our space, some of our space at a rate of 650 per square foot. Okay, you say some of your space, so where does the rest of the rent come for the remainder of your space? So our kindergarten programs operate, uh, operate in a different way. So the city doesn't cover those under the subsidization. They're covered uh, in part by the province and in part by us. Okay, so if, if, we, if the city decides to remove or, or not support or pay that grant, your suggestion or council of eight was just the TDS would come back, TDSB would come back and charge you $11 per square foot? That is correct. For something that was, so they're actually, why wouldn't they be charging six fifty plus the $4 to make it 11 now? So it's my understanding that the six fifty is an agreement that they've had with the city for well over 10 years and that it's a grandfathered in rate that actually does not cover their costs. But because they 
like everybody else, know that if they go to the city and say, we're going to raise that rate to $11, they lose the agreement. They maintain at $650. So they are cross-subsidizing now, but are also suggesting that if the agreement is terminated, they cannot continue to cross-subsidize. My understanding from my discussion today was that our rate would instantly go up to $11 a square foot, which is what we pay for our other space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Anyway, I want to uh, thank all of the, the deputants who did come before us tonight. Uh, there was about 35 here that came today. I know not everybody's here. I uh, just want to thank you. Uh, your voice is incredibly important in this process. And uh, I think that on behalf of the Budget Committee and the other councillors are here, thank you for uh, participating in the uh, budget consultation at East York. Thank you. Oh, I gotta, we're going to do uh, a quick motion. Uh, that the Budget Subcommittee for City Hall, Scarborough and East York Civic Center consultation received for information the public presentations and the communications submitted by the members of the public. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. We are adjourned. Thank you.